Good morning. Welcome to Hope Fellowship Online. Thank you so much for joining with us today to worship our Lord and hear the word. Let's just raise a hallelujah to the Lord today together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, 
thank you, Lord, for giving us a reason to sing, Lord, a reason to worship. We praise you, God, and we raise your name higher than any other name. Thank you, Jesus. so thankful that the Lord conquered the grave, he conquered death for us, and he turns graves into gardens. Let's sing this song together. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along And you put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me Nothing is better than you. 
that you, Lord, turn our mourning into dancing, Lord. You turn our graves into gardens, Lord. Seas into highways, Lord. Bones into armies, Lord. You are the God of the impossible, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you, Lord, that there's no one and nothing better than you. No one and nothing, Lord God, is better than our God, our King, our Savior, our champion, our victor. Lord God, you are our all in all. Lord, we're so grateful for you in our lives. We thank you, Jesus this time we're just going to take a moment and pray for our needs and our concerns and the things that are on our hearts so if you have a need right now I'm just going to invite you to lift that up before the Lord maybe even lift your hands up as we just prepare to pray pray over your needs today Heavenly Father we thank you Lord that there's nothing that is impossible for you that is nothing too great or too big for you God And we know, Lord, that you hear our prayers, Lord, and you see the needs of this body of believers, Lord God, and we just ask that you would work, Lord God, in their lives, that you would come before them, Lord, and make a way and make a highway, Lord, where there is no way, Lord God. We thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. We thank you for our healing that's going to come forth, our provision, Lord. Everything, Lord, that we need, we know comes from you. And we thank you for hearing our prayers today, Lord for being our all in all, for being everything that we need. Lord, we just lift up these requests to you, Lord, knowing that you hear us and knowing that you see us. Lord, once again, we pray for your healing power to just sweep through this land, Lord God. Lord God, let those who are infirm, Lord, feel healing and power today. Lord, all those who are in the hospital, Lord, let them be lifted up, Lord, by the power of your might, God. We're so thankful for you. Lord, we just love you. We praise you. We give you thanks, Lord. And we just pray that that day will come back together again as a body of believers in your church would come soon, Lord. Lord, let it come soon. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm no longer a slave to 
Just continue to worship our God this morning.
darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken worship you this morning God we give you all praise we give you all honor we give you all glory God thank you for the very breath that you breathe in us for giving us love for giving us hope with everything that's going on God we know we can depend on you we know we can lean on you Thank you, God, for being our rock, our redeemer, our father. And you're such a good, good father. And we love you, God. God, fill every home. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit, God. We need you, God. We need you like never before. We're so thankful, and we give you praise, and we give you honor, and we give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. And we all say, Amen. Good morning. It's Pastor Tim here. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Hope Fellowship. And we're going to transition now into our offering. As always, there are two ways you can give. You can give by mail. That's P.O. Box 579 here in Chestertown. And then the other way is you can give 
online by going to our website. So I'm going to bless this offering as you prepare it. Father God, I thank you for each and every person watching this live stream. And God, I thank you that uh, they have just continued to give. God, as, as they do, would you bless them and bless that gift so we can continue reaching people for your glory and for your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, we've got a couple of announcements for you this week. First up, uh, you've probably already heard, uh, but we're still asking for your Mother's Day pics. That could be anyone. Send us a pic of you with your mom, with your kids, with your grandkids. Uh, send that to us by Wednesday because we're preparing something very special for Mother's Day next week. And then, as always, make sure you catch me live on uh, Wednesday night on Instagram for our online youth service. And then we have a Zoom after party after that. You can DM us on Instagram for all of those details. And then on Thursday night, you want to make sure you catch Weekly with the Watermans, our Bible study. And then on Friday night, for the kids, we've got a bedtime story with Pastor Molly over on the Hope Kids Ministry Facebook page. So let's continue with the word this morning. It's hard to be judged for one mistake, but it's what I'll be remembered for, I guess. I wasn't always the doubter. That's not who I am. I have a zeal for Jesus. I always have. When Lazarus died, no one wanted to return to Bethany with Jesus. The atmosphere there was volatile and dangerous. Jesus said he'd show us his glory. I assumed we'd all die there. Still, I'm the one who said, let's go. But then, then came this room. That night. At the time, none of us understood as we sat at that table. This is my body. This is my blood. He raised the dead. He, he cast out demons even. What could he possibly mean? I didn't doubt it when they told me he was dead. But how can you not doubt someone coming back to life? Some didn't doubt. But for me, it was harder. Maybe it was just that I didn't want to be disappointed. Many came after me who believed without seeing what I saw. Jesus called them blessed. Yes, I touched the place of the nails, the hole in his side. Such definitive proof that I cried out, my Lord, my God. But that wasn't the only amazing thing. The Almighty One, He came back for me. He didn't want to leave me behind in my doubt. He says, I'm worth that. And I'll follow Him anywhere for the rest of my life. We're quickly coming to the end of our verse-by-verse -verse study through the New Testament book of John. Believe it or not, only one more week to go after today. Let me remind you where we've been in this study. John brings his gospel to a close with four different personal encounters that Jesus has with his followers after his resurrection from the dead. And those, those encounters are very significant for a couple of reasons. First, they prove to us that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. Second, they're evidence that Jesus was who he said he was, the very Son of God. Third, their testimony that what Jesus said about salvation is true, 
that he is the way and the truth and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him, that there is no salvation from sin except through the innocent blood that he shed on the cross to pay for our sins. Finally, these post-resurrection appearances teach us the why behind it all, the very reason that Jesus went to the cross. It's so that we could have a personal relationship with God. Jesus died on the cross to make that possible. And it's through him that we experience abundant life. Jesus said this back in John chapter 10, verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it, notice what it says, abundantly. Let me tell you what abundant life is not. It's not that all my wishes and desires and dreams would come true. A lot of people think that's what it is. Nor is it the absence of problems in your life. Jesus said, as long as you are in this world, you will encounter problems. This is the primary reason, I think, when people think that abundant life is all my wishes and dreams and no problems. This is why a lot of Christians wrestle with doubt, because they don't understand what abundant life is. Let me give you a good definition of what abundant life is. Abundant life is the presence and the power of God at work in your life. And it's experienced through a personal relationship with Jesus. You see, these personal encounters with Jesus that John records, they're evidence of that truth. Now, we've already studied two of the personal encounters. First, we saw how Jesus came to Mary Magdalene and helped her overcome her sorrow. Last week, we saw how Jesus came to the disciples and helped them overcome their fears. Next week, we're going to find out how Jesus helps Peter overcome his failures. But today, we're going to see how Jesus helps Thomas overcome his doubt. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about Thomas. We don't know, we, we, we don't know what he was doing for a living before he started following Jesus. There's a thought that maybe he was a fisherman too because we see him in John chapter 21 fishing with the disciples when they went back to Galilee, but we don't know that for sure. What we do know is he was a twin. Look at how John introduces him here, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin. So get this, Thomas is an Aramaic name that literally means twin. And the, in, the, in the version we're using this morning, it says the, called the twin. It's literally in the original Greek. It's a Greek name called Didymus. So his name was Thomas Didymus, and that meant twin as well. So people literally called him twin twin. Now there's, there's no mention of who his twin is. John, or, or Thomas, is only mentioned one time in each of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and each time he's mentioned in those Gospels, it's only in a listing out of the disciples. Everything that we know about Thomas comes from John's Gospel. I think in some ways, uh, Thomas has gotten a, real, a raw deal throughout church history. He's been forever branded, get this, as doubting Thomas. Can you imagine being labeled by Christians for centuries to come, doubting Josh or doubting Tim or doubting Gladys or whoever it may be? I mean, that's rough stuff when you think about it. I think it's safe to say that Thomas lived his life on the pessimistic side of the spectrum. He was kind of a glass half empty type of guy. But I would propose to you that he was also a way better man than church history has given him credit for. See, here's the deal about Thomas. Thomas was a realist. He was a practical thinker. He was a planner. He was very logical in how he did life, and he was very grounded in reality. And get this, he was as loyal and as devoted as they come. I want you to see what I mean. Three times in the Gospel of John, we encounter a place where we see Thomas saying something. The first time that we find Thomas speaking in John's gospel is in chapter 11. Now, here's the scene. Jesus and his disciples are about 20 miles outside of Jerusalem near the Jordan River. When word comes to them that Lazarus, a good friend of Jesus, is very Ill, Ill and near death. Well, Jesus doesn't go back to Jerusalem right away. Instead, he waits a couple of days, and then he tells his disciples, here's the deal. Let's go back to Jerusalem to see Lazarus. And look at the disciples' response to him. John chapter 11, verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews. Now, they're talking about the religious leaders there. The Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? 
So here's what they're saying. Jesus, this is not a good idea. Have you forgotten the religious leaders just tried to stone you? That's why we're out here in the wilderness to begin with. I mean, if we go back there, they're going to kill you and they're going to kill us both. They're going to kill all of us. Jesus says to them, look at this, verse 14, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So here's what Jesus is saying. Guys, what I'm about to go do is going to strengthen your faith in me. So I need you to trust me. It's going to be okay. Come on, let's get moving. Now, the disciples, they're not sure about this plan at all. They're, they're just like, what are we doing? But Thomas trusts Jesus. Look what Thomas says in verse 16. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, that's an interesting response because I, I see a couple of things there. First, we definitely see the pessimism, right? Okay, boys, here's the deal. We're all going to die. But I also see something more. Look closer. I see a statement of faith. I see a man full of faith. I see a man full of courage. That's Thomas. I see a man that loves Jesus so much and believes in him so much that he's willing to go anywhere with him, even if it means death. So there's great courage here in the statement from Thomas. Do you understand the courage of a pessimist a lot of times is greater than the courage of the optimist? I mean, the optimist thinks it's going to work out well no matter what, but the pessimist has to overcome those pessimistic thoughts, not to mention what's in front of him. There's great courage here in Thomas's response. Thomas had more faith than all the other disciples here in this chapter of John. And his faith, and get this, his faith, it wasn't based on fantasy. It was based on what he experienced as he walked with Jesus over these past couple of years. Think about what he has seen. He has seen Jesus heal the sick and cast out demons and multiply the fish and the loaves. And he's seen him calm the wind and the waves. He's even seen Jesus raise people from the dead. And he says, boys, let's go. If we die, at least we're going to die with Jesus. So Thomas, come life, come death, was resolved to be with Jesus no matter what. He loved Jesus that much. I mean, he has great faith in Jesus. Now, let me take you to the second time that we see Thomas say something in John's gospel. It's in John chapter 14. Here's the scene. Jesus has just informed the disciples at the Last Supper that he's going to be leaving them. And they are absolutely floored. They're shocked. Their hearts are very troubled by it. And so, in response to their troubled hearts, look what Jesus said to them. Very famous passage of Scripture. John 14, uh, starting in verse 1. Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now watch what Jesus says in verse 4. And you know the way to where I am going. Now, you and I read this because we live on this side of the resurrection 2,000 years later. We've studied it to death. We understand that Jesus is talking about the cross here. We understand he's going to prepare a way for us to be with God for all of eternity and that knowing Jesus is what gives us eternal life. We know that, but understand what Jesus is saying here. You've got to remember, before Jesus' resurrection, these disciples, they just couldn't wrap their minds around it all. They are absolutely, totally confused, and that's when Thomas speaks up, right? I mean, right, what, what is Thomas? He needs to have a plan. He needs to know clearly what's going to happen. And so out of that need to know the plan and know what's going on, Thomas speaks up. Look what he says in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Now, understand, this comes from the same heart that we saw back in John chapter 11. On one side, you see his pessimism. Jesus, you say we know the way. Uh, Jesus, we don't. What are you talking about? You're not giving us a clear direction here. But on the other side, you see the devotion of Thomas. Jesus, we followed you all this time, and you're going to leave us? I mean, his heart is very troubled by that thought. By the way, if it wasn't for Thomas and his question here and his personality, 
we wouldn't have recorded for us one of the most important verses of Scripture in the entire Bible. Look how Jesus responds. Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now that brings us to John chapter 20, the third time that we see Thomas speak in John's gospel. In between John 14 and John 20, all of Thomas's worst fears have been realized. Jesus has been arrested, he has been crucified, and he has been placed in a tomb, and Thomas's world has fallen apart. There are a couple of words that describe Thomas before his personal encounter with Jesus. The first word that would describe him is distant. Look at it with me. Verse 24, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So Thomas was nowhere to be found on that first Easter night when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. Now we're not told where he was, but could it be that Thomas is a lot like us when we feel like God has let us down? Think about it. Thomas has followed Jesus for three years. He's left everything to walk with Jesus. He was as devoted and as loyal as they come. He didn't skip a beat. He didn't miss a Bible study. And it didn't work out like he thought. And he feels like Jesus has let him down. That's the root of Thomas's doubt. Have you ever been there? You believed, and it didn't happen. You prayed, and God didn't answer. You followed, and you found yourself dealing with pain that you could have never expected. Can I tell you, that's Thomas. He believed, and it didn't work out like he thought, and there's no way he plans on going down that road again. So there's a hardness of heart that has developed within him. And what's one of the first things we do when we get a better heart towards God? Isn't it true that we tend to distance ourselves from the things of God? and the people of God. I've watched that happen many times in my own life when I'm confused. As a pastor, I see it happen all the time. People come to Jesus, things are going well, they're excited about growing, and then all of a sudden they find themselves wrestling with doubt and they start to distance themselves from the people of God and the things of God. That's Thomas here in this passage. And that's tragic. Because Thomas should have been in that room on that first Easter night. He spent a week longer in turmoil than he should have. And who knows what would have happened if he hadn't been in that same room with the disciples a week later. It could have led to a lifetime of turmoil. Can I just say this? And I'm not saying that God can't meet you anywhere because he can and he often does, but the quickest way to hear from Jesus when you're wrestling with doubt is to be with God's people. Remember what Jesus said? When two or three are gathered in my name, I am there also. We find Thomas distant because of his doubt. There's a second word that describes Thomas and his doubt. Let's call that disinclined. No matter what the other disciples tell him, he just won't believe. Look at it. Verse 25, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. So after the other disciples have their encounter with Jesus, the first thing they do is like, oh my goodness, we got to go find Thomas. So they track down Thomas. Great news, Thomas. You are never going to believe this, but we've seen him. He's alive. And man, he just showed up in the room and the doors were locked. And he said, peace be with you. And he appeared to us out of nowhere, scared the living daylights out of us. But that's what happened. And we touched him. And we saw the scars where the nails were were. We saw this, where the spear went in his side. He even ate a piece of fish. And get this, he wasn't a ghost. He wasn't some ghost from the dead. It was real. He really has risen. We've seen him. We failed him. We've experienced it. He's really alive. But Thomas is disinclined to it all. He refuses to believe. What's interesting, when it, when, when it says here in the text that they tell Thomas, we've seen the Lord. In the original Greek, that's over and over and over again. That's the tense of the Greek there. And so listen, time and time again, they keep coming to Thomas all week long. Thomas, you got to believe us. Thomas, I don't know why you won't believe us. We're not, we're not lying to you. And Thomas says over and over, guys, I don't want to hear it. 
I mean, why won't he believe? Think about it. These are his friends. These are people who love him and care about him. These are people that he can trust. Why won't he listen? Because disappointment has caused doubt. And doubt has caused him to plug his ears and to close his heart. He doesn't want to hear it. Isn't that the experience so often when you try to witness to people? And you're like, man, I just got to tell you what Jesus has done in my life. And sometimes you share what he's done in, the, in your life and they just look at you and they're just not interested. And can I tell you, one of the reasons is, is because life has left them very bitter in their heart. And so they're disinclined. That's Thomas here. Well, there's one more word that describes Thomas in his doubt. And that word would be defiant. Look at it with me. John chapter 20, verse 25. But he said to them, what's this? Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Unless I see, there is no way that I'm ever going to believe. You know what he's really saying here? He's saying, look, don't tell me what to believe. I followed him for three and a half years for what? I wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be this way. Thanks, but no thanks. I'll do this thing called life my way on my terms from now on. And the only thing that's going to change my mind is if I see the, the scars. Do you understand this is a time defining moment for Thomas? Because if you think about it, he runs the risk of taking the path that Judas did. Remember Judas? Judas, who hardened his heart, decided to do things his way, and we all know how that turned out. It didn't turn out too well for Judas. And so here is Thomas, and he's full of doubt. He's distant, he's disinclined, and he's de as defiant as they come. Well, that's when Jesus shows up on the scene. Verse 26, it says eight days later. So this is a week later from when Jesus first appeared to the disciples. So it's a Sunday night. It says his disciples were in, inside again and Thomas was with him. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, if I'm one of the other disciples here, I'm, I'm like, Jesus, you got to stop doing this because you're scaring the heebie-jeebies out of me. Sometimes I wonder, now we're not told this in the text, but sometimes I wonder, could it be possible that the disciples set this whole scenario up hoping that Jesus would come and minister to Thomas? Isn't it true that you'll do anything that you can to see your loved ones and your friends come to know Jesus and have an experience with him? Well, it's possible that's happening here. However it was, however they got behind those locked doors, make no mistake about it, this post-resurrection encounter with Jesus was all about one person, Thomas. And there are a couple of things about it that I want you to see as we work our way through it. First, I want you to see that Jesus met Thomas in his doubts. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't come into that room and condemn, condemn Thomas for his doubts. He didn't criticize him or berate him or give him this big lecture about why he should have believed. Instead, what you see is a personal Savior come in grace and in love to help him overcome his doubts. I would even go so far to say that I don't think that Jesus minds our doubts. I don't think he minds our questions. Because here's what's, here's what's true about our doubts and our questions and our concerns when we're wrestling with those things. They give Jesus a chance to strengthen our faith in him like nothing else. Some of your greatest testimonies will come out of your greatest doubts. Certainly true of Thomas here. Jesus is not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your doubts. He's not, con he's not offended by them. In fact, I would say to you that Jesus welcomes them. We see that when John the Baptist was wrestling with doubt in Matthew chapter 11. Let's go there for a moment. I want you to see this because this is consistent with how Jesus deals with the doubts of his followers Matthew chapter 11, let me remind you that Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest man ever to be born from a woman. Think about John the Baptist. He was, his, he was a strong man of God. He was full of faith. He was as anointed as they come. He was devoted. 
He experienced God do amazing things in his life, yet he too found himself wrestling with doubt as he's sitting in prison because he was arrested for his faith. So go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verse, uh, verse 2 here. It says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, why is John questioning Jesus about who he really is? I mean, isn't it the same John that baptized him in the Jordan River and he heard the voice of heaven say, this is my son whom I'm well pleased and and saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove? I mean, didn't you experience that, John? Why are you wrestling with doubt? Here's why. Because how the Messiah, how the Messiah, how this whole plan was unfolding was not what he expected. He thought it would be different when the Messiah came. And one of the reasons that is, is because he didn't understand there was a first coming and a second coming. And so that threw him for a loop like it did for a lot of the early disciples. But he's wrestling. Hey, this isn't matching up with what I thought was going to happen when the Messiah came. So he's wrestling with doubts very similar to Thomas. I'm not sure I thought this is how it was going to go. So is this really the one? So he sends the question to Jesus through his disciples. It says in verse 4, and Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Leopards are cleansed and the deaf hear and the deaf are, and the dead are raised and the poor have good news preached to them. Do you see that Jesus doesn't say, I can't believe you, John. I mean, he doesn't condemn him either. He doesn't braid him either. Instead, Jesus receives his question, and look what he does. He points John to the evidence. You know what the evidence was? The Old Testament Scriptures. See, the Old Testament Scriptures predicted that when the Messiah came, that he would heal the blind, and he would make the lame walk, and he would cleanse the leopards, and he would give deaf people the ability to hear, and he would raise the dead. And oh, by the way, you really want to know it's the Messiah besides those miracles? You're going to find him out, not around the religious elite, but he is outreaching the poor and the broken. That's how you're going to know it's the Messiah. Jesus helped John the Baptist overcome his doubts by pointing to the evidence. And it's exactly what Jesus does to help Thomas overcome his doubts. Can I just say something? Faith is is not based on fantasy. It never has been. It never will be. Faith is based on the facts. The second thing we see here is Jesus showed Thomas the evidence. Let's go back to John chapter 20. Look at it. Thomas, put your finger right here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Jesus in his grace does the same thing for Thomas that he did for the other disciples a week ago. Look, touch, see. Listen, those scars were evidence of a couple of things for Thomas. First, they were evidence that Thomas, that Jesus really did rise from the grave, that it's true, that he's not a ghost, that he really is in bodily form. It really did happen. Second, they were evidence that Jesus really was who he said he was, the very Son of God. And we're going to see that in just a minute in Thomas's confession. But there's one more very important thing that these scars were evidence of. They were evidence to Thomas, get this, that Jesus loved him more than he could ever imagine. By pointing to those scars, understand what Jesus is saying. He's saying, Thomas, if you ever doubt that I love you, if you ever doubt that I've abandoned you, if the pain in your life tries to convince you that I'm not sovereign and in total control, if you've ever been tempted to think that I don't have a plan for you and a purpose for your pain, here's what I want you to remember. These scars were all about you. They speak of my great love for you. Thomas, my resurrection is evidence that I have the power to redeem you from all things in your life, your sins, your pain, your troubles, even your doubts. 
So Thomas, come, touch and see and look and place your fingers here because I want you to understand you don't have a dead Savior in your life. You have a living Savior in your life. Not only does Jesus meet Thomas in his doubts, point him to the evidence, but the last thing that Jesus does, get this, he invites Thomas to believe again. Look at verse 27 into 28. Jesus says, do not believe, disbelieve, but believe. Can I just say, this is not so much about Thomas that he never believed. This is not like Thomas is an, Thomas is an atheist, and that's not the issue here. What Jesus is doing here is he's inviting Thomas to follow him again. Let me put that another way. He's inviting Thomas to trust him again like he did before the cross. Believe in, Tom, in John's gospel. When John mentions believe throughout his gospel, it's never just about head knowledge. It's about feet that follow. And Look how Thomas answers. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Do you get it? Out of Thomas's doubts came one of the greatest testimonies that was ever declared anywhere in the Bible about Jesus. My Lord and my God. And once again, I'm going to say it. Your greatest testimonies, a lot of times, will come out of your greatest doubts. You know, the church history tells us that Thomas would go on to declare his testimony about Jesus for the rest of his life. Church history tells us that Thomas, out of all the disciples, traveled farther away from Jerusalem to share the gospel than all the rest of them. He ended up in what is present-day India. And even if you go to India today, there are temples that are named after him. There are legends that are talked about about him because Thomas and his testimony made such an impact in India 2,000 years ago. And people, think about this, and people are still being ministered to today by his testimony. And they're finding life in Jesus and coming to know Jesus through Thomas's story even to this day. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 20, verse 29, watch this, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? And the answer is yes. Thomas had the luxury of seeing the risen Lord. But there are going to be people that are not going to be able to see that. But there are still going to be many that come to believe because of stories like his and because of the gospel records and the word of God as it is preached. And so look what Jesus said. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Do you know who Jesus is talking about there? You and me, if we know Jesus. Do you understand God did such a powerful work in Thomas's life, that his testimony did not stop with his death. Church, church history tells us that he was martyred because of his faith in Jesus. He was run through in India with a spear. That's how he died. But here we are 2,000 years later, and people are still believing even though they hadn't seen the physical risen Jesus like Thomas did because his testimony is such a powerful testimony. And as John ends this section of Scripture, John's brought to the recollection of, this is why I wrote down my gospel, that there are going to be people that didn't see what we saw, but as I lay out the evidence, my hope is that they would believe and find life in Jesus just like we have. Look what he says here. He says, now Jesus, verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. That you may have life in His name. Listen, and I don't know if you're out there this morning, it's very possible that there are many of you this morning that have never put your faith in Jesus. And as we've preached this sermon, God has been drawing you to Jesus. 
is the Word of God has gone forth. Your heart has been, been lit with, with the words of God. Can I tell you, God loves you and wants more than anything else to have a personal relationship with you. Jesus went and died on the cross to pay the price for your sin so that you could be reconciled to a holy God and have eternal life forever through faith in him. And that's not just a ticket to heaven. Oh, that's part of it. It's a personal relationship with not a dead God, not a God that's based on fantasy, but a risen Savior that's based on fact. If you've never put your faith in Christ, I'm going to encourage you to do that. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If that's you, would just bow your heads and let's pray together. Would you just pray this from your heart to God's dear God? I come to you today, God, and I thank you that you love me, that you went to the cross and you died for my sins, that I might be reconciled to a holy God, that I may have eternal life. I confess that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Jesus, come into my heart and come into my life. Be the Lord and God of my life. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. I want to talk to you Christians just for a moment. Listen, I really believe that as I was writing this message, it just was so strong on my heart that there are many of you that are wrestling with doubt. And Jesus says it's time to trust again. And you have enough in your head to know that that this Jesus thing, there's something to it. You've experienced too much, like Thomas. But then there's a part of you that's very distant because there's some things that did not happen the way that you thought that they should happen. And I feel like the Lord would say to you this morning, it's time to go back to work. It's time to start trusting like you once did. It's time to start serving like you once did. Because the living Savior wants to work through you that more people would come to know him. If you're out there this morning and you're wrestling with some doubts, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit just to do a work in your heart that he would set you free. Would you just lift your hands to the Lord and let's pray together. Father, I just come to you this morning, God, and I thank you for the Thomases in the Bible that we can study and we can learn and we can see how a personal God deals with his sheep. And Lord, I pray out there right now, there are many that have been wounded for life, that wounded in their life, and they, they have looked at it all and they don't understand. And maybe there are things they might not ever understand, but they would know that you love them more than they could ever imagine. That's what the scars and the wounds tell them. That every, each nail mark and the spear mark were all about the love, God, that you had for them. Lord, I pray that they would never doubt you. I pray that they would never doubt that you were in control. I pray that you would, they would never doubt that you can help them not only overcome their sins, but overcome their sorrows and overcome the negative things that have happened in their life and even use them for your purposes and for your glory. Lord, I pray that you would set them free right now. I pray that today would be a new day. Lord, I pray that there would be a new spirit that would come into them. Lord, I pray that there would be new life that would begin to flow into them as they begin to believe like they did long ago. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are not a dead God. You are not a God of fantasy. You are a God that is real, that is living Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for releasing us from our doubts. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Well, listen, God bless you. We'll see you next week. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. a child of God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a 
try